Hey, howdy everyone. In our previous lecture, we introduced the concept of Bayesian linear regression. And now that we're dealing with that system, and we recognize it's, it's very powerful. We can incorporate priors. The distributions for the parameters are being estimated directly. It's really cool stuff, but we can't solve that problem directly. We need to sample the problem, sample the posterior in order to solve it. And so let's talk about how we can do that using Markov chain Monte Carlo. Let's, let's go ahead and talk about some of the fundamental concepts behind M Markov chain Monte Carlo. First of all, it is a class of algorithms for sampling from probability distributions. A Markov chain of samples, their equilibrium distribution should be equal to the target distribution that we're seeking after. Each Markov step sampling from the target distribution. More steps that's more samples, and that'll be a more accurate assessment of the distribution. We're going to rely on Markov screening. The concept is that the state of our sample, t plus 1, is only dependent on the previous sample. In other words, we don't look at the history, the conditional probability of a current sample given all previous samples is only equal to the conditional probability of the current sample given the previous sample only. In other words, this methodology can be applied when we can't get to the distribution directly, but we want to be able to construct a set of samples to search over the range of possible outcomes. And we need it to be set such that it spends an amount of time in each interval within the possible solution space proportional to the actual density of that distribution. In other words, we're trying to get to a posterior with our Bayesian linear regression, and we can't get directly to it for a continuous variable, but Markov chain Monte Carlo, we're able to sample from that distribution. If we do enough samples, we'll actually know what the distribution is. Okay, let's, it, it, that seems a little bit complicated. Let's go ahead and walk through. We'll kind of, we'll step we'll step up towards that problem. Let's start with something very basic. Let's forget about Markov chains, and let's just think about a, a very simple Monte Carlo method to solve a very simple geometric problem. Okay, so we have this area of interest right here in X and Y, and we want to know what is the ratio of the area of the triangle to the area of the box. So we want to solve for the proportion of this box that is triangle. Okay, so what would be the Markov methodology to solve this problem? What we could do is we could do Monte Carlo sampling independently from X and Y. What would that look like? They would be, we would be sampling from uniform distributions from X min to X max, Y min to Y max. And if we do that independently, the result is we will get individual samples like these. I drew these as Monte Carlo samples and they'd be uniformly distributed on each axis. Now, what we do next is we take that point and we check, am I inside the triangle? If you are, turn it red, that's an in point. Or am I outside the triangle, turn it blue, that's an out point. Now, I hope you can see that if I do that enough, I do enough samples, I do a thousand, a million samples, 10 million samples, and so forth, what will happen is my assessment of the area of the triangle as a proportion of the total area as calculated as the number of points within the triangle divided by all points in and out, that this will get very precise. This would become a very precise estimate. So what have we done? We solved this geometric problem for which the only thing we could do was we could tell if a point was inside the triangle. Never once did I have to calculate the area of the triangle. But by doing enough samples, I got to the distribution. In this case, just simply a proportion, and it was pretty straightforward. So the general steps of Monte Carlo, define the domain of possible outcomes, generate random samples, and aggregate and summarize those results to get your answer. Now, let's, so let's go one step further and look at the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo. So let's take a really nice example right here. This example was taken from Wikipedia. They have a really nice page on examples of Markov chains. And this is the very simple weather model. 
And so here's our problem right now. We have a sunny or rainy state from day to day. And we want to be able to calculate what is the probability of sunny or rainy weather. And all we have available to us are the following conditional probabilities. If it's raining today, it will be a 50% chance to be sunny tomorrow. If it's raining today, 50% chance of being rainy tomorrow. Oh, satisfies closure. That makes sense, right? 50-50, right? If it's sunny today, 10% chance of being rainy tomorrow and 90% chance of being sunny tomorrow if sunny today. So these, this is what we know. Now, I don't know and I can't get to the global probability of sunny or rainy. I just know these conditional probabilities. Now, they're Markov property because they have a Markov property because the future state depends only on the current state, not information from way in the past. Tomorrow depends just on today. They're irreducible because every possibility, every transition has a probability of occurrence. So we're able to explore. You'll see we'll be able to explore the problem very well. And they're aperiodic periodic because there's no getting trapped. We're not going to get trapped in sunny. It'll just be sunny. We won't just get trapped in rainy. It can go back and forth anywhere. There's no way to get trapped in the system. Okay, let's go ahead and do Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation. So step number one, pick a random state. Just pick one. This is categorical. We'll just pick rainy or sunny. Okay, sunny. Sunny day today. That's good. Love the sun. So we have sun. Now we go to the conditional probability. We want to do a Monte Carlo simulation to generate our chain, to keep our chain going with its correlation, its structures as defined by these Markov properties and rules, Markov rules. So we look sunny day today, 90% chance of sunny, sunny tomorrow. We do a Monte Carlo simulation, sunny. We rolled the dice or we used a random number seed and we got a number less than 90%. It's sunny. Okay, so sunny again. We do that again. It's sunny. We use the same rule again. Oh, we got something that's now rainy. Rainy. Oh, once it's raining, 50% chance of being raining. Okay, raining again. Oh, 50% chance of sunny. It's sunny again. 90% chance of being sunny. 90%. You see what I'm saying? And if we keep going long enough, these are going to be a nice set of samples from the global proportion that we're seeking, the probability of sunny or rainy. Now, you could start another Markov chain, and often that's what people will do, is they'll have multiple Markov chains. So we'll start another one, and it doesn't matter the state. We'll start it out as rainy. And, well, 50% chance of sunny after rain. Okay, sunny. 90% chance sunny, 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 lots of sunny, rainy, oops, 10% chance of that happening, it happened. Now 50% chance to go back to sunny, 90% chance to be sunny, 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 and keep going. And so what we'll have is after enough samples, we have enough samples of, the, of that global proportion of sunny and rainy that we'll find out that it is about... 0.833 or 83.3% chance of sunny and 16.7% chance of being rainy. And we got to it by sampling that global proportion by simulating with Markov chains using Monte Carlo simulation. Markov chains, because they're correlated, they're stepping through day to day. They have Markov property of only seeing the day before. They're really cool. Okay, so we got something really cool. Let's summarize what we've done. Markov chain summary. Um, Markov property, future state only depends on the current state, not the long history before. We were able to step through and explore the solution space knowing only the probability relative to the current state. Now, if we were doing um, Metropolis Hastings and other types of methodologies, we'd be working with relative likelihoods and so forth. The main thing is that we step through in a way that is actually informed by the global proportion or the global distribution, the posture that we don't have. It knows it's proportional to its local density. Okay, it's reducible in the, from the perspective that there is a probability of going everywhere, that we're able to explore the solution space. We don't get stuck. We don't get trapped in cycles either. Now, you could note that if we had a much more complicated system, there's the chance that our first few steps aren't very good. That's what's known as the burn-in chain. The initial steps, they're not retained. 
they may overly sample low probability regions. They haven't got to the really dense part of the probability distribution. They haven't converged in the system. They're no, the equilibrium state is not matching the target distribution at that point. How do we deal with that? You do a trace plot. I'll show you a trace plot later. You look at the samples versus number of steps and you'll see a distinctly different behavior early on and you'll say chop it off that's not at equilibrium yet. Posture chain is once we settled into the equilibrium solution or right, it's matching the target distribution so each step is a sample from the target distribution. So let's go ahead and look at the Gibbs sampler. Gibbs sampler is great it's pretty simple pretty straightforward. What we're going to do is we can go ahead and use Gibbs sampler in a situation where we actually can get to the conditional posterior distribution. We don't know the joint. We don't know the full posterior distribution, but we know the conditional. And so we want to sample in a conditional manner. What does it look like? Well, let me give you a simple example of sampling from the conditional of the posterior for the case of a bivariate Gaussian distribution. Okay, so this is the space of possible values, x and y. And we want to go ahead and sample. And I've drawn that the contours are available to us, so we can actually see those contours of what the bivariate Gaussian distribution density should look like. High density here, low density going out. We know the bivariate Gaussian. So assign a random value for x and y. So x, y, and we got this value right here. That's not a very good value. It's, it's not. It's outside. It's super low density. Probably shouldn't be there right? What we do next is we sample from the conditional distribution of x given the y naught. Okay, so if you calculate the conditional distribution of x given this y value, you'd find it's a distribution that goes like this. Goes right there. So we draw a value from that conditional distribution for x, and now we have x1 comma y0 right here. So we've stepped all the way over here. Now we're going to sample from the conditional distribution of y given x1. So that conditional distribution drawn in this direction would have a bump like that. Its mode would be right around here. So we go ahead and we draw from it. We get this value right here. Repeat, 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 repeat. You see what's happening here? And if we do this long enough, we will explore and sample the bivariate Gaussian distribution with densities of samples that are proportional to the actual densities of the target distribution. At no time did I even have to use the joint bivariate Gaussian distribution. I only needed the conditionals to get there. So that's that's what we're doing. We're sampling the joint posture by using only information about the conditionals. That's very powerful. Okay, so how would we do Gibbs sampler for the purpose of the case of linear regression, the, the Bayesian linear regression. What we can do then is we can assign random values for the intercept, the slope, um, for each one of the 1 through m predictor features, and also for the variance term, right? Remember, we're modeling the entire distribution of uncertainty. We need to know the homoscedastic variance of the system. You remember we were applying it to the identity matrix before. Okay, so what we can do now is we go ahead and we'll, and I'll, as I step through here, I'm going to assume m is equal to 1. I don't want to write out a bunch of stuff. We can sample from the conditional distribution of the intercept term given the y, x observations and all of the previous values of the parameters. So that's the conditional we sample from. Now the good thing is for many distribution assumptions, we know we can calculate these conditionals for some problems, and, and so we just have the conditionals available to us. We can go ahead and then we sample for the slope term, given that intercept term we just got. Then we sample for the variance term, given that, and then we repeat, 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 repeat. And so what's happening here is by the time we've got here, We've actually got one sample for every one of the parameters. And so this is really powerful. We're counting for their correlation structures with regard to each other. We're sampling from this very difficult posture. And we just repeat that one time, 
two times, three times, all the way up to L, and we'll get L samples. Now, we could check the trace plot, as I'll show you, and we could check to make sure that we don't have burn-in chain. If we do, we have a different behavior in the parameters up front. We chop that off and we start working with the posture chain where things have started to stabilize again into that equilibrium that's matching the target. Now, I'm not going to go into any details about these conditionals for the purpose of Bayesian linear regression. We could teach an entire course on Bayesian methods specifically around this. There's a lot of theory we can get into. I think for the purpose of this class, this was enough to talk about as far as Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation as a methodology to solve Bayesian types of machines and sample from the postures. I think that was sufficient for now, and I hope that you found it helpful. Now, next what I'll do is I'll provide a Bayesian linear regression example, and that'll be in the next lecture. All right, for now, thank you very much for listening. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. It is my joy and pleasure to share data analytics and geostatistics machine learning with anyone who wants to learn about it. In fact, to the point that I spend time recording every single one of my lectures that I teach in the university here, and I provide them to anyone in the public. I'm so excited. I get great feedback from professionals working in my industry in the subsurface and development, and um, keep, sending, keep sending me happy messages and letting me know if this is helping you. I am like a DJ here. If you send me uh, a request, I may actually play your song. So let me know if there's something else you want to hear about. If you have feedback, I'm all about sharing knowledge. All right. Thank you very much for um, attending. Okay.